Hi everyone and welcome to Side Dance Podcast Season 3. I'm your host Jasmine Cook. This is a dance science podcast presenting discussions with global industry leaders, aiming to make research and information more accessible and enhance dancer wellbeing, health and training at all levels of the sector. New episodes every Monday 6am London time. Side Dance thanks Ballet Rosa for sponsoring today's episode. Ballet Rosa inspires dancers from all over the world with apparel and accessories for male and female dancers, designed using the highest quality materials and engineered for a high level of comfort, mobility and performance. Ballet Rosa is renowned in the world of dance for their harmonious mastery of technical materials combined with artistically inspired design. Check them out and find out more at www.balletrosa.com. Hi everyone and welcome back to Side Dance Podcast. I'm here today with Frances Clark. Um, I'll let Frances introduce herself, but I'm really excited for this episode. We're going to be focusing mostly on Frances's PhD, which looks at balance. Um, and Frances is based at Trinity Laval at the moment. So welcome, Frances. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. It's great to be here. If you just tell us a little bit about yourself, so a bit about what you do at the moment, your career, it's been quite varied so far. So maybe if you start in your introduction to let us know how this influences your work now. Yeah, thank you. So um, I uh, sort of started uh, dance around eight, uh, eight years old. And then uh, having decided after a few years, I'd really like to sort of uh, follow a career um, in dance. Um, I went away to um, Tring, which is part of our education schools, which is a ballet boarding school at 13. So um, there were kind of many less opportunities then to follow dance performance, you know, through different routes. So um, quite often, if you didn't live in a very big city, uh, you sort of go away to these big vocational schools. So I had some uh, very happy years there, predominantly training in uh, ballet and just with a tiny little bit of jazz, um, maybe in sixth form. I then finished my training in the other part of the school, um, in London, which then was just sort of by the Barbican. And then um, I went, um, I absolutely um, fell in love with jazz, so although I did lots and lots of ballet there and singing and lots of music, um, I really fell in love with jazz. So I kind of went to uh, study, or rather um, perform, um, in Madrid and Barcelona, um, on and off for over two years to get my full equity. So in those days, you had to do sort of 40 weeks of an equity contrast to get your full equity. So I worked in theatre companies and TV companies, um, mostly with other um, dancers from all around the world who sort of gone through similar training uh, to me. So I learned quite a lot of stagecraft. We did some big tours, uh, worked in probably over 100 theatres uh, on, on tours. So um, uh, yeah, that was kind of great uh, experience. Uh, I then sort of came back to um, London and just before I'd left London I'd been uh, um, involved in the sort of setting up of Springs Dance Company. I was still at school so quite a few founder members of Springs Dance Company um, at the time. Uh, about, about half of us were still just finishing up our dance training and then the other half were from um, who'd already worked in companies particularly uh, ballet companies um, in Europe as well and uh, the two founding directors Angela Hardcastle and Martin Blogg um, sort, of, uh, sort of set up this company. It was just part time. We worked on weekends and and in holidays. So I came back to London and worked um, a little bit with them. But then I had quite a career change because um, I uh, got engaged. I'd already met um, Martin, my husband, actually when I was at arts, edu at arts education school. He worked in the city, so nothing related to dance whatsoever. And uh, then had quite a career change and went to um, the Larvin Centre, which was called then in Lolly Grove, did a dance degree, um, and of course did lots of uh, contemporary then as well as uh, ballet and lots of other studies. And uh, that's then the field that I worked in after that uh, for the rest of my career as choreographer and dancer. So um, after that, I did a PGC at Bedford. Um, really, really missed performing, but um, you know, it's very difficult to sort of have a kind of project-based career then. You had to often sort of go off on tour for long periods around the UK, but particularly abroad um, uh, as well. So I set up and um, dance at Wandsworth um, School, in, um, uh, which is Girls Comprehensive uh, in, in Wandsworth in London, and worked with a tremendous uh, number of people there in the arts. They'd all been practitioners in the arts. So that was um, very, very instrumental in my um 
my kind of learning, if you like, how to be a teacher, how to interact with school, how to interact across um, departments uh, as well. So that was very influential. And then I was missing dancing quite a bit. So sort of in the holidays, we'd go back and do some tours abroad uh, with uh, Springs Dance Company. And then um, after a few years of teaching, but sort of keeping doing more and more dancing, uh, I then um, went to Islington Sixth Form Centre and taught A level, but just for maternity leave, and then went back in to actually um, being a dancer <laughs> and running. Uh, I was then um, asked to be artistic director of uh, Spring Dance Company for a period of time in the 1990s and choreographed, danced, and did some A level teaching, some advisory work as well, and had three daughters. Uh, moved up to Birmingham. Uh, sort of over 20 years ago for um, sort of a job reason for my husband and uh, I, my youngest was only uh, a few weeks old then so we settled into the city and then I set up dance at um, uh, Helzo in college which is an college and then shortly after that um, got appointed to senior lecturer at University of Wolverhampton where I uh, ran uh, sort of over time ran a number of different uh, undergrad dance degrees and also got very, very involved in research. Um, so this was a, a great joy of mine. So I did the MSc there and then a PhD there. And then I joined uh, Trinity Laban about three years ago, um, almost exactly as uh, Dean of the Faculty of Dance. Amazing, yeah, so varied. But I think something we talk about a lot is how often people in dance science have that background in dance themselves, which can really help to inform their work. I didn't realise that you came to Laban so recently. I don't know, I thought that was was earlier, but just three years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so just almost done a year and then the pandemic hit, so uh, just kind of getting back onto track now. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I hadn't even thought about that. Amazing. So your work, maybe if we start with sort of Wolverhampton looking at balance, if you introduce us first to the sort of definitions of balance, balance tests in dance, which we're going to talk about today. Um, yeah, balance is a field on the whole, and then we'll move into some of your more specific studies and work. Yes, okay. So it was one of the sort of ideas that, that came to me about the sort of um, the topic, if you like, for my PhD it was just actually you know, being a practitioner. Um, um, I'm sure it was based earlier on sort of working in rehearsals uh, with companies, but but particularly uh, teaching. I taught um, sort of over the years there, ballet, sort of advanced, uh, contemporary and uh, jazz, plus any, uh, a number of other uh, studies and academic studies as well. And I was just really, really interested in the kind of um, how people kind of dancers moved across the, the space, how they're affected by different things um, to do with maybe sometimes shoes, particularly um, in jazz, to do with um, how they were adapting to new uh, material, um, maybe sometimes kind of lack of confidence you saw, in, you, you know, as, as opposed to then other people had a lot of confidence to travel. So many, many different factors. And I was just really interested in that kind of shift of weight um, whilst travelling, but also in kind of um, uh, sort of fairly more kind of centred exercises. And I did um, um, a biomex study in the MSC that looked that used the force plate um, in the devil pay using different types of shoes. And it's probably from that that sort of came my, my sort of uh, development, if you like, of actually wanting to look and explore that further um, in, the, in the PhD. So the balance has... Um, you know, it's, it takes a little bit of, of a while to sort of explain that, but it's um, what my PhD particularly looked at was um, uh, balance, stability and um, control. And so a number of uh, tests, which I'll, I'll go into more in the future, sort of uh, in, in a few minutes, just actually uh, one of the novel balance tests I did looked at both those things, which is quite unusual. So quite a few tests to look at either stability um, or control. So, um, so I particularly sort of centred um, on that and sort of then defined, um, um, sort, sort of went in a bit more detail into actually stability, uh, postural stability and postural control and used both sort of tests that used, um, that either exam one or the other in some of my field tests. And so the kind of uh, one interesting thing that sort of, um, you know, research has shown that sort of postural stability is similar to postural control but it's um, an inherent ability uh, rather than um, an act. 
And um, one thing that sort of also came up in early studies was just that um, postural control strategies can either be predictive or reactive, or quite often a combination of, of both. And I was kind of interested in sort of seeing what one might find out uh, about this, sort of actually looking in, in kind of uh, quite basic tests um, that are used, that are quite often used for dancers, uh, but also kind of taking that further into more novel, more dance specific tests later on um, in the PhD. Yeah, definitely. Francis, if we could just, that's such a great overview. Could you just tell me a little bit about the most common sort of tests that we use for balance? So maybe a little bit about each of them, just in case listeners aren't aware of them um, and different sort of scoring systems that we can use for balance. Yes, yeah, yeah. So there are obviously quite a few tests I didn't use in my PhD, but I did use some of the kind of most commonly uh, used field tests. So if I just kind of run through in a kind of, you know, couple, a few sentences <laughs> just about the kind of uh, synopsis of, 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 the, of the PhD. So first of all, um, the aims really of the thesis was to sort of um, sequentially test the assumptions um, of associations between field balance tests um, and between balances, um, dancers' balance ability and their dance um, performance, and then building onto that, uh, developing a kind of um, reliable dance specific balance scoring test, and also looking at um, testing protocol examining the effects of balance training in a randomised control trial. So first of all, I looked at um, five field balance tests, which are, are often used. This followed a systematic uh, review um, of, of balance um, that's been published. And so sort of much of this was sort of taken from that sort of early research. So I looked at the star excursion balance test, the Romberg, uh, the airplane test, the biosway balance test, and a dance specific pirouette test, um, which um, have been quite a few um, studies using pirouette tests, but they're all uh, obviously um, a little bit uh, different. So the kind of was, you know, the results showed very little associations between those tests. So these tests are generally, apart from the, the pirouette test, have been. Um, um, Quite often, uh, or some of the tests, particularly um, Biosway, Star Excursion, Rongbe, for example, have been used either in general population or sport population. So there's an assumption that often they're kind of quite functionally sort of uh, relevant for dancers, uh, but it hasn't sort of been particularly uh, tested, tested um, in that way. Then the next study actually um, used those results and then uh, um, applied those, and look, we looked at sort of um, all. So sort of I really examine the associations between those field tests and um, the participants' technique and repertoire scores. And we looked at um, ballet, contemporary and uh, jazz in that. So I looked at um, the, the scores that they'd got in technique and also repertory as well. So that was actually from uh, the canon of professional repertoire in each of those um, areas. So again, it's kind of um, very dance specific and actually um, rather than completing sort of simple tests, but actually actually looking to see whether there are associations. So again, um, very few um, associations in that. And really that suggested a limitation in the sensitivity of the tests for the dance population. The next two studies uh, looked more functional um, Test. So I used um, time to stabilize, stabilization test uh, on the um, force plate and included um, a two, two to one jump, uh, which is sort of, you know, forward moving jumps are quite often used uh, in its basic form um, in dance. Um, and uh, uh, I looked at bilaterality uh, between that. Uh, and again, that didn't show any difference. And then the next study looks at the exam, examine the effects of fatigue using the same time to stabilization test. And again, um, that had no significant effect on dancers' postural um, stability. So again, similar to the earlier studies, this functional test, uh, which has been used quite a lot in the general population and in sport, um, really showed limitations um, and they, they include very, very basic movements for dancers. And again, lacked suggested, um, it suggested that they lacked a sensitivity to measure all the variable postural control adaptations that are used by dancers who use some highly complex 
um, adaptations in terms of movement. Yeah, can I just so ask, building, sorry, Francis, can I just ask, so why do you think that is? So why are dancers so different to the other populations that these tests seem to be effective with? Uh, well, we haven't tested all other populations, but in the sense that um, they sort of, um, there, there are one or two studies that have particularly looked at kind of um, neuroscience as well, and um, which I kind of touch upon sort of later on um, in studies. And it's just that um, there are very, very few studies at the moment that show this, but just that they they have sort of quite high levels of kind of, again, this kind of reactive and predictive adaptability. Um, and they um, often, you know, you know, as a dancer, sort of sometimes either dancing or teaching, this is something I noticed sort of anecdotally in the, in the, the classroom, just that um, you can, um, you know, be doing a piece of, conducting a piece of adage and you sort of, you, you might see sort of people wobbling or they're sort of not con controlling very well and then you just stop, give a little bit of feedback. A minute later, they look completely different. So we have these very, very highly trained, um, reactive um, and predictive uh, sort of mechanisms. Um, and again, it's kind of highly developed through, suggested through our, through our training, um, but it's also um, um, to do with sort of um, our sort of motor senses, motor control um, as well. But again, there are kind of, you know, all the studies in dance and balance, none of them have been replicated <laughs> throughout th the systematic review showed that. I looked over a thousand papers, uh, none have been sort of uh, replicated. So again, it's this, you know, we have to kind of be aware of the limitations of that argument. But it does suggest that many of the tests that we're using um, in dance at the moment are, are not particularly sensitive uh, enough. The next stage was to actually develop something that's a bit more dance specific. So first of all, I um, developed a kind of novel balance school. This is called the Accumulation Balance School. And this was um, for the first time to gather data on postural stability and control. So that's uh, kind of um, uh, quite unique in that way, in a variety of dance specific settings. So it's a kind of scoring system that looks at um, uh, control and stability. Uh, it just, it's got a simple score and you can actually um, uh, test it actually in rehearsal. Um, you could do in performance though. I would suggest that, that that's less relevant because uh, then be, I'm sure, um, performing their balances sort of very well, but it could be used in any range of different things. For the PhD, this was, this was used on um, um, fit and injury-free participants. So, um, so I developed uh, that, and then the point of that was that actually it could be used um, to score dance sequences, so rather than just to kind of static or very, very simple, say, jump, you know, dynamic balance. It could actually be used for quite a long sequence with maybe different balances um, in it. So then I um, uh, developed a kind of uh, dance sequence uh, with four different types of balances and it was sort of quite testing movements before, either a movement down to the floor or a sidewards jump. Um, or turn before a balance. So the, the quite complex movements before each um, balance. And then it was tested um, on that. And then the last study was randomized control trial, where um, I had two training groups. Uh, one was um, supplementary training using amended star excursion balance tests. So very different that that was novel, just kind of lunge into the directions and then back onto balance. So it was used to training tool only. Uh, and then a number of uh, different um, uh, protocols, including um, dance specific balances on a vibro sphere. So it's kind of um, um, sending vibrations through kind of um, a balance ball, and also um, some jump protocols as well. So that's a supplementary group. And then again, something which kind of really interested me was an in class training group. And uh, this was, um, was all randomized in terms of time, type of balance, the, direct, the um, instructions um, to balance. But this was conducted over four weeks. And um, so participants improvised. Um, they, they were used to improvisation. And then at, at random times, they were, they were asked to actually balance on right or left. Um, they were also going to balance flat or rise. 
So again, very, very different. And that was kind of very um, interesting because they were sort of uh, not using the kind of, um, in a way they weren't sort of using the kind of opportunities to employ more commonly used balance strategies, which we're using all the time, probably even subconsciously. Um, but, but in fact, it was uh, allowing them to maybe use more um, um, unexpected, you know, because they were doing unexpected disruptive movements, if you like, kind of free movement. Uh, it, it reduced um, the kind of opportunity to allow the kind of balanced strategies that we sort of tend to use maybe always in a turn or always when we're sort of doing one, one de genre, et cetera. They were kind of mixed results. Um, but the improvisational um, in-class movement and the um, supplementary training did... Um, uh, show the greatest increase in postural stability in one of the balances that I had in the sequence. And that was actually possibly the most uh, challenging balance. I mean, you know, maybe the others were, were less challenging, <laughs> but this was a kind of um, um, some travel movement and then a big jump sidewards uh, and then straight into a rise. And so um, the participants sort of, um, you know, anecdotally viewing them, you know, you could sort of, um, they had to rise for a few seconds as well. Um, so uh, they found that most challenging, but those that were from the supplementary training group and the improvisation group, um, that was the kind of greatest increase in postural stability sort of shown uh, in that test. And again, it's that sort of, um, it's that ab ability to maybe work um, less with the kind of more commonly used balance strategies and to be able to adapt uh, to that. Yeah, um, there's much work to be done. Um, you know, the, the kind of idea of kind of training through improvisation or with kind of randomised balance could be interesting. Uh, again, if one did it too much for dancers, they will probably maybe develop their own <laughs> um, balance strategies. Do you know what I mean? It, it could might be used... Um, in the future, it might be used maybe in rehab. Um, it could be used um, intermittently with dancers, maybe to train tool. Then I think there are a few other areas that could be used, um, but also in elders uh, and those with sort of uh, maybe reduced ability to uh, sort of control balance. So um, yeah, I was going to add. So you mentioned that not much has been replicated yet. Sort of why do you think that is? Firstly, and then secondly, what would be the first thing you would want to to replicate which study would you want to do again to, to find out more? <laughs> um, well, I think the kind of balance test, the accumulation balance score needs to be um, ideally sort of replicated and I'm sure fine tuned. Um, again, it's a field test. Um, you know, there are always limitations to how you could uh, use it. Um, but again, it does look at posture, um, postural control and stability, which I think is, is uh, unique and, and uh, key. But also the, um, the sense of improvisational in class, because again, it, it's, it's, um, it's, it means that the dancers can't rely on these balanced strategies that they, they commonly use. I mean, each one is very different, um, but we all have different ways uh, of using um, the different strategies that, that we have in, according to maybe the genre that we do and the kind of dance that we do as well. So that kind of, um, I'd be interested um, in kind of uh, just developing that, maybe replicating it. And also the kind of um, supplementary training was very interesting, but maybe removing some more of the kind of um, one or two studies and actually just honing in on actually specific ones because you, you can't particularly tell which one of those may have maybe have predictive or associated task yeah yeah definitely and i'll link as many as many of those studies as i can below if they're like published and able for read them um, for listeners to go and have a a read afterwards to get a little bit more insight on those is there anything else you would add on yeah, on those studies before we look at how we might use this research in the studio? Um, no, I don't think so. I think it's just, I mean, in the way I was sort of going to sort of chat more about sort of the future, it does relate to what you said, actually, just kind of where we sort of need to go in dance. Yeah, so how yeah. do we... I'd love, so to, to, as well. yeah. <laughs> I'd love to know, how do you think we could 
we could train balance and so what's the best way in our dancers kind of upcoming what's the best way with all these different tools and tests that we can train balance well, dancers? kind of one of the first things i was going to say but it, you know with limitations i think is we need more replication studies that that's just general across dance science it's a very small small field um so we do need more replication studies but then what are you replicating and then whilst i have shown in, in these studies that maybe is very little association between some of these things and sort of testing those assumptions and maybe a few tests we're using them and um, aren't sensitive uh, enough. Um, uh, of, co of course, I haven't tested um, all the tests, but it's just, um, it's kind of, I suppose, kind of looking at research that's out there and not just kind of examining what you, what you actually want to uh, replicate um as well um sometimes you need greater sample numbers sometimes maybe try more novel dance specific approaches as well that can take quite a bit of time you need lots of replication again refining um but again it's kind of trying to make things more functional more dance specific um but also recognizing that actually dance is often um, including those in training but particularly professional dancers in in any genre have extremely good balance skills <laughs> so you know throwing throwing something out <laughs> out there how much do we need to test balance do we need to test it do we need to test it in different ways in maybe more unexpected ways do we actually you know our training includes lots lots of, of balances anyway so we learn to adapt it and we learn to use balance strategies all the way through in, in any genre that we use so um why do we keep testing balance, um, either in screening, things like that, uh, unless it's for rehab. But maybe we sort of employ some slightly more novel um, tests as well. Uh, again, recognising the limitations uh, about that, but actually um, um, making the balances um, more challenging for dancers, but, but also, um, again, possibly more improvised or more free. Um, or more unexpected, so they actually have to employ, so they find that that's sort of more, more challenging, um, really. Um, I think we need to keep testing assumptions. Um, that's through lots of dance science, so it's not just this, but also, uh, again, I sort of mentioned more functional um, testing. Um, and and just, just, just bearing in mind that dancers do have these sort of complex um, strategies there is a kind of um a, a ceiling that uh ceiling has been spoken about um just in the current measures for um dance so that's already most studies we have possibly all in dance have actually maybe have actually reached the kind of ceiling effect of actually how we test dance's balance so do we need to look at sort of something something different um and also, um, again, it'd be good to look at sort of testing balance in other genres uh, other than Western traditional genres, but recognizing also they're also <laughs> expert in balance, but how do we kind of actually make balance more challenging to that? But again, you've got this kind of um, problem of kind of replication of studies as well. So it's great to kind of go out and try all these different studies, but actually, um, you know, the study one and two I did in my PhD was, was kind of interesting just because we're actually taking existing tests and actually testing those assumptions. Um, so, so sometimes the studies needed like that as well. Um, and I think it's just clearly set, setting up limitations as well, you know, when you set up methodologies and test or if you publish, um, just be sort of very clear there's some, sometimes quite, a, you know, quite a few assumed suggestions that this, this may have an effect, may not, but maybe the sample testing is very small. Um, the balances may be well within the range of the dancers. So the systematic review also throws in quite a range of different kinds of studies um, within kind of set um, inclusion and exclusion criteria. But dancers have been shown to have sort of um, sometimes um, much poorer balance than other athletes or someone's in the same level as um, general population. But again, due to kind of um, 
maybe other kind of effects such as um, eyes closed or um, perturbation and things like that. But again, those are very, those are just one off studies. So again, we need to kind of uh, replicate that. There's yeah. again, it's, an ex it's a really exciting field. There's probably a few different areas we can go in um, to actually uh, look at sort of how to test um, more, maybe um, using dance specific. Uh, sequences, much longer sequences, uh, sort of, um, you know, can create work that actually creates really, really challenging balances and use the accumulation balance school test. But again, you know, once they repeat it and they rehearse and then they know you often, they're being tested, the dancers are employing all these very, you know, expert control balances. So again, it's, it's the kind of unexpected which kind of goes back to that um, uh, improvisational. And then this kind of balance, you know, I remember I Adams quite a few years ago, um, a few of us were there, just had a kind of, um, I think, uh, Matt Wine and Margaret Wilson, I'm sort of leading sort of um, a kind of more informal talk, and just kind of getting people to kind of look at the different kind of balances. And there are still some kind of, movements which um particularly sidewards jump big sidewards jump into a balance say into a rise um which um throws just throw up more challenges but maybe that depends on genre level of experience so my phd was on um undergraduates um where you know relatively large sample sizes so kind of over 80 um in in the studies uh but nevertheless um you know, might be a little bit different uh, than professional dancers. So, for example, the randomised control trial, we may have found something a bit different. Yeah, definitely. And I think, like you said, it's really interesting because with dance, you can be so creative. And like with the sequences, there's no end really to how you could keep testing balance. Like it doesn't, it doesn't need to be rigid. You can be so creative with it. Yeah, just two more questions today then, Francis. So part of your research focuses a little bit on the impact of mindset. So for example, the use of self-talk and imagery, how does this tie into balance? How does this affect it? Um, so I didn't, I didn't look at that in my PhD, but I've used that quite a bit um, in teaching. And um, one idea would be to sort of maybe look at that um, in, in the future. So we've had discussions about that um, with a few sort of, of those working in, in um, imagery and sort of um, psychological skills training. Uh, so sort of anecdotally, um, so quite often, uh, again, I'm just going to pick one example here, but again, a kind of quite a complex balance skill, for example, in adage, um, sort of ballet or, or jazz uh, or contemporary. And that's uh, some, and again, these are with undergraduate um, dancers, but often sort of high level, but not, not professionals. And um, I used to find that sort of sometimes they'd be sort of going through the, the sequence to be done reasonably well. There might be sort of almost a, sort of a slight lack of confidence. And then just sometimes um, we'd sort of stop and we'd talk about the use of imagery. Again, make it very personal for them, as in what worked for them. But if they could actually focus on imagery, uh, but also sometimes use self-talk, use self-talk in, in other areas of the class as well. And that kind of often within, you know, next time you did it, literally half a minute later, make a big difference. I mean, I found that in myself as well um, as a dancer. I mean, some of that, though, I have to say, whilst we employ those psychological skills training, um, and they, they can be found to be very, very effective in bands, what they're doing is maybe... Um, is actually focusing your attention. So it's helping with concentration and your attentiveness. So it's kind of a refocusing. So we can get um, distracted sometimes for a sort of split second. It, it could be, for example, on the stage, it could be sort of an uneven floor or just you notice something literally split second and it can really, really affect uh, balance, particularly as sort of a very kind of complex um, balance movement. And so sometimes that kind of um, employment of either one of those two things um, can help. But, it, but really, some of that's actually redirecting focus and attention. So again, that, that's another kind of um, uh, interesting area for the future, particularly maybe in some sort of very, very complex skills. So some of the things that um, I looked at, which is in general, publication, sport, 
and have been applied to dancer um, are not challenging enough. But, but again, it might be some very, very challenging things. And maybe use more in training um, as well. So if you're on a vibro sphere, which is sending um, particularly more advanced one, where you've got quite a kind of wobble, a kind of a wobble board and vibration training through, or just, just a wobble board, particularly so in rehab, then um, one might employ those, particularly if you're doing sort of quite, you know, quite advanced sort of movements um, on that, or, or in class as well. So again, some sort of interesting areas, but particularly I would say more for training, but, but as a professional, I've actually used some of those myself. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. Kind of like a split second. Just like. Yeah, no, very true. It's really interesting. Have you got anything else to add on performance psychology in this part of the dance science field, or is that? No, I mean, not related sort of to balance. No, no, lots of other things to chat about. But, uh... <laughs> sure. Thank you so much, Francis. Is there anything else you'd like to mention or discuss today, or have we covered everything? No, no, I, I just... Um, uh, my email is on our website. So if anyone's interested, I've just been in, in chats recently with them, uh, another researcher we've been chatting for a couple of years just about sort of looking at um, motor control, motor skills, um, and sort of memory and balance tests. So again, it's kind of, you know, working in different populations, but maybe bring it into dance. So there's lots and lots of... Um, interesting work out there. I know there are a few different researchers that I know sort of working in different fields. So again, if anyone um, is interested in contact with me or seeing the work that I've done or sort of chatting about future plans, uh, it'd, be, it'd be great. So uh, yeah, yeah. And, and again, you know, whilst we work within the field of dance, actually maybe some of, of what we find here through dance, uh, including it, much wider into dance health could actually be taken into different populations as well. Uh, so it's sometimes making it dance specific for dance, but actually then taking some of a few of those things out where um, applicable to other populations uh, as well. Yeah. yeah, and tying it all together, that's great. And I can link, I'll link as many of those papers below so that people can find out a little bit more if they're interested and also link your email below as well. So I can put some contact information in the show notes if people would like to reach out to to make that a bit easier. Thank you so much, Francis. It's been so great to chat to you today. I'm really grateful for your time. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye. Thanks so much for listening. Tune in again next Monday. And in the meantime, follow at Side Dance Podcast on Instagram. It would also be so appreciated if you have a moment, if you could please rate and review on Apple to help the podcast grow. Bye. <laughs>